Billie Holiday, when was it that you first realised you had an interest in singing and the spoken voice? Well, I grew up being very musical as a child um, and I was always told that I could carry a tune um, and I was a very confident kid, so I was always singing like Disney in the back of the car and stuff like that. Um, and then when I got through to primary school and high school, I kept getting asked to be in choirs and leading bands and stuff like that. And I started to realize, well, this is something I could actually, I really enjoy this and I could maybe make a career out of this. Um, and so then when I went to university, I studied, um, jazz voice and I just thrived in that environment and loved that. Um, and as for the spoken voice, I didn't really know a humongous, humongous amount about that until, I got a vocal injury in 2007, which was like right in the middle of my jazz voice degree. And I was out one night with friends. I was in my early twenties. We were drinking. I was not well hydrated. Um, and we were like by this stack of speakers and I was having this like full on DNM with, with some of my friends. And so I was talking a lot. And then I went to bed and I woke up and in the morning I couldn't speak at all. And that happened for, that was the same thing for three days. I couldn't make any sound. Went to an ENT, which I'd never heard of before. Um, and he scoped me and he's like, you've got a very small you know, nodule. Um, you're going to go and see a speech pathologist and you'll be fine um, in, a, in a couple of weeks. Um, and so then I went to see a speech pathologist and I had a very confusing experience with the speech pathologist I saw um, I wasn't really educated on what a nodule was and what was happening and how long things would take. And the, the advice I was given was to not speak at all for six weeks, which as we, we know now, that's not, um, that's not best practice. Um, it's really similar to if you injure your, let's say your knee, you wouldn't just not walk on it for six weeks. You'd have re like gentle rehabilitative exercises to strengthen the muscles, strengthen the ligaments so that when you do decide you need, you're going to walk again, it's going to be strong and you're not going to re-injure. So I had a bit of a, uh, an odd experience in the whole, um, you know, medical world of ENT speech path wasn't explained well to me. Um, and so I just ended up not seeing this speech pathologist anymore. I just Tried not to speak for very long um, each day, but I would just gently start to warm my voice back up and then I was fine. Um, so that led me down a path because at that time I was teaching singing um, and I had been thrust into this world of singing teaching because I could sing, so therefore you can teach, um, in inverted commas. Um, and I started to realise, man, I don't actually know anything about the vocal anatomy. I don't know anything about, I all I, I was teaching my students from feel. So what felt good to me, what I could do, and I could do a lot of things with my voice, but I'd run into problems when I'd have students whose anatomy and whose, you know, physiology was not the same as mine and I couldn't get them results. Um, so that led me down the path of, well, I need to know more about this. How can I find out more? And at the time there weren't lots of options. Um, for that type of training. And so I went back to university and studied speech pathology and became a voice specialising speech pathologist. And here we are. And here we are. <laughs> that was a long rant, wasn't it? No, it's great. It's really nice to see the journey and what was influencing you along the way. So now you're here with us on the Singing Teachers Talk podcast. It's really lovely to welcome you, Ellie. So thank you for giving your time. That's all right. It's lovely to be here. It's fair to say that most of our singing lessons probably begin with a bit of a catch up, checking in with the student, taking an interest in their week, maybe getting some feedback on their practice and kind of setting up that rapport that we want for the rest of the session. And as we chat away, we can get an insight into the vocal status of the singer through their speaking voice. So can you help us to understand what we're actually looking out for there? Yeah, of course. So typically when I'm, and I I um, see people in a clinical sense as a speech pathologist, but I'm also a singing teacher. So I see both of those types of things. When singers come to me for singing lessons and I'm chatting to them, I'm listening for vocal quality. So the things I'm looking out for are, is there strain in the voice, which might sound a little bit like this. Hi, my name's Ellie, how are you going? 
um, roughness, which um, might sound a little bit like this. Hi, I'm a bit rough when I'm speaking. Uh, you know, it's kind of a little bit poppy and all over the place um, or too much breathiness through the tone. So if someone's very breathy. Um, and the other things that I'm looking for are a strength. So is the voice is it strong? Is it bold? Can I hear it? Is it too loud um, or is it too soft? And it's kind of, you know, falling off on the on the wayside. So that's kind of quality that I'm looking for there. And the next thing I'm doing is I'm looking at how they're breathing when they're talking to me and they're not thinking about it. Are they breathing high into their um, into their chest area. It's like the th it's called thoracic breathing, but actually I'm looking for activation of their sternocleidomastoid muscle, which is the muscle that runs from behind the ear to underneath the clavicle and the top of the breastbone. Are they taking short, sharp breaths in all the time? Are they taking low, relaxed breaths, low in their body, and I can't see activation in their neck? Um, that gives me a pretty good indication of maybe maybe they're experiencing some anxiety Maybe there's some tension in their body. Um, yeah, so that's really the big things that I'm I'm looking for when I'm talking to someone. And I suppose at the end of it would be something called a breath holding pattern, which is if someone is talking to me and um, they're stopping their words all the time like this, some people might know that as a hard onset um, or a hard offset um, or both. Um, and you, what that means to me is that when I can hear that stopping is that they're using their vocal folds to um, stop and start the breath rather than their respiratory muscles, which are the muscles in between their rib cage um, and their abdominal muscles. Great. And you also posted something on your Instagram last year that was really cool saying that not every vocal injury is because of singing technique. It could be because of the spoken voice. And so I got thinking into when we check in with the singer and we're hearing their spoken voice, is that voice only healthy to us when it's perceived as clear tone and balanced? Or can you still have a healthy voice which has a presence of husk or rasp? Yeah, so what is classified as a healthy voice is one that can sustain over the time you want it to sustain for. Um, and that can do the things that you want it to do. And if it can do both of those things, it's a healthy voice. So for someone, like I have a pretty clear tone, I have some roughness in my voice sometimes, but I could talk to you for eight hours nonstop and I know I would be fine. Um, whereas if I'm speaking and I've got what seems to be a really clear voice, but I'm coming to you and saying, my voice gets tired after 30 minutes, but to you, you're like, oh, but it's clear, it doesn't have breathiness, that's an issue. So really, we are looking for those things that we can, like I was describing before, see and hear. But as you were talking about before, you know, um, building that rapport, asking questions about how the student is, we're also wanting to be doing um, what I call a case history on a student when they come in and I'll ask them, how has your voice been? Have you had any voice loss? How is your, um, you know, ha has your voice gotten tired at all this week? And if they say, yes, I'm investigating, okay, when, what were you doing, you know, was a loud setting. And that's when we bring in conversations around um, environmental education um, and learning how to actually care for the individual voice. So um, if your voice can do what you want it to do for as long as you need it to do that thing and it still feels fine afterwards, it's a, it's a sustainable voice. And I, and I have a bit of a thing about calling voices healthy or not because that's not really apart from what I just kind of described then, we can't say a healthy voice is one that sounds clear with no breathiness, no roughness and no strain. Um, it's, it's if it is able to be functional for what you need. And that is what I would consider a healthy voice. So I would say taking away the word healthy and saying, is it, is your voice sustainable and is it functional for you? In the singing lesson capacity then, if you are listening and you're assessing some of these things and you, you, identify potentially some anomalies that haven't been there before, what would usually be your next steps after you've asked some questions? Um, well, the next steps literally would be that line of investigation and like, when does it happen? How frequently? Um, 
was there certain foods that you were eating before this happened? Have you been sick? That type of stuff thing. Then we'd have a conversation about um, how long it has been going on for. So if it's something that is just acute, which means happens very fast, usually I'd say we're going to wait at least two weeks before we decide, okay, let's get you on to some, you know, more medical clinical help. So speech pathologist, you know, throat doctor, um, maybe even a voice physio. Um, but what you're trying to do is you want to educate him in that time on what to monitor. So usually there's this really um, cool exercise I have called the swell test. Um, and what it is, is you get people to be very, very breathy and very, very light and you get them to pretend it's like an owl, an owl sound that you're getting them to do. Um, and the sound is like who, and you get them to go all the way up to the very top of their range until their voice cuts out. And it has to stay very breath and very light. And what it gives you an idea of is where, if there is any swelling in the voice. So it will sound like this. And obviously I could get keep going because I don't have a sw sw swollen voice, but a swollen voice might sound like and then the phonation stops, the sound stops. You don't have to get them to do any special scale, you just say go up, um, especially if the person that you're with is maybe isn't a, um, you know, is, a, is an amateur singer and doesn't know a humongous amount about the voice, don't worry about the scale, we're just listening to if that quality cuts out. The reason we wanna keep it breathy um, is because we're trying to stop someone from engaging their laryngeal muscles too hard, so we're not wanting to create that strain. And the reason we want it light is that if there is swelling in the vocal folds, it's very, very, very hard for someone who has swollen vocal folds to sing high, quiet notes. So typically I'll give someone that exercise to help them monitor and say, look, every day you're going to do this swell test at the same time every day. Um, and you're just going to see what's the highest note you can get up to. And if it stays the same, like let's say they've said, oh, Elia, you know, the cute thing was I... Um, can't sing as high as I used to two days ago. And so I figure out where's the highest I can get to. And then I'll say, okay, over the next couple of days, uh, over the next week or two weeks, you're going to same time every day, see where you are. And if it gets less than that, um, if their range gets shorter, we know, okay, let's go to see someone on the medical front. But if it starts to get more and more and they're able to sing higher and higher, you start to know that the swelling is reducing um, and so that gives you an indication of whether it's something that needs to be dealt with very quickly um, or whether it's something that um, we can see if maybe it was a cold or something like that um, and we can work on function. Earlier you said about how certain injuries like nodules, for example, don't need us to be on complete vocal rest for weeks on end. So if you do hear that it, there's some swelling on the voice at the beginning of a lesson. What are you going to do next in terms of do you continue the lesson still just on some like gentle SOVT stuff or how are you then amending what you may have planned previously to make sure that it's more appropriate for them? Yeah, um, pretty much exactly what you said. I find an SOVT that um, in SOVT exercise um that complies with where their voice is at the moment so i'd go through a few and ask them whilst they're doing them what feels the most comfortable i'd see what can get them the most range what can get them the best function i'd pick the one where their voice isn't cutting out i'd pick the one where it's the smoothest and the easiest so we always want to build our warm-ups and our exercises from a place of success so find what your students can do best and then we work off of that um i would Pretty much always stay away from open vowels like ah, uh, oh, oh, those ones where the, the tongue is back and down and the jaw is quite open just naturally because that's just what those vowels naturally do. And I want, if I'm am doing like, um, if I'm wanting to use some vowels, um, I'd be using ones where they're more closed jaw, um, further tongue forward vowels. So things like ah, eh, er, um, 
those three usually. And at the start of it, I'd make sure there wasn't a, a hard onset. So I'd be using um, consonant sounds like H, H, um, Y. They're all, y sounds always give us a nice smooth onset. So like E, Y, Y, E, Y, things like that, where I know I'm naturally going to get that SOVT back pressure because my jaw is more closed. Um, so, yeah, start from a place of success. Play around. Don't be afraid to play around with a few exercises to find what's best. Um, and then if they still want to, you know, workshop a song, um, I would stay away from the belty parts, the high energy vocal parts. Um, and I would go through the song not on the words, but on the SOVT sound that you found to be the most effective in warm ups. So you can make sure you are making the ideal placement for that person to get the most consistent, smooth, um, safe feeling sound for them. As well as staying away from the high intensity stuff like belting, is there anything to suggest that we should also be singing repertoire that is lower than that moment their voice is cutting out? I don't know about like um, evidence as per se, but if the voice is cutting out and it's not able to get that sound very well, um, I would say, you know, you can try some of your SOVT exercises and warm up around that area and see if you can get some more function. But I wouldn't be going full out in that area, especially if we're talking someone who has an active vocal injury. If they actively have nodules, nodules only happen in the middle part of the vocal folds and they happen bilaterally. So they play off of each other. So they're always one on one side and one on the other. And what the reason that they happen is because the vocal folds are pressing together medially and coming together there first and too intensely. And so the body, our bodies, which are incredible, go, oh, I keep getting hurt in this one spot. I know what I'll do to try and help you. I'll add some extra, some extra tissue, some extra fluid in that middle part where I keep getting smacked. And that's when we get a little nodule form. A nodule is just our body trying to, to look after the tissue that's already present in our body. It's, it's an incredible, like essentially like a Band-Aid that our body makes for us. Um, except when singers get nodules, we go, oh my gosh, I've got a nodule. And we freak out about the nodule, which is actually the symptom. And what we need to be working on is not getting rid of the nodule. We actually need to be getting, we actually be working on what caused the nodule in the first place. And typically the thing that caused the nodule in the first place was, um, you know, maybe you were sick for a couple of weeks and you were doing lots of coughing. And so as a result, the middle of the party of vocal folds smacked together a lot. Maybe, you know, you've had allergies and you've had post-nasal drip and there's been swelling. And then when you go to talk, it's connecting more in the middle. Um, maybe you've just changed jobs and your vocal load has changed. So you're having to talk more than you usually do. Maybe you're stressed or anxious and all the muscles are tense and they're smacking everything together. Um, and so when we're talking about working with and training singers who have been diagnosed with nodules, the aim isn't for you to be able to get them to sing with the nodule. It's how do we get you the most safest feeling form of singing that's not going to aggravate the nodule so that it doesn't think it needs to stick around? Because the point of voice therapy is we work out how can we get you to speak in a way that doesn't make the vocal folds push together in the middle and makes everything come together nice and evenly. And the more we can get you speaking and singing with that even vocal fold vibration, that's when the body goes, oh, I'm not getting hurt in the middle anymore. Awesome. I will, uh, I'll take away that extra tissue that I've given you to protect it. Um, and it just gets absorbed back into the body. And then our vocal folds are vibrating typically again. So um, it's very important for singers to understand that nodules are a symptom and the cause is how you are using your voice. And I would say from my own practice, 95% of the time when someone comes in with nodules who's a singer, it's got nothing to do with their singing technique and it's got everything to do with the way that they're talking or that their um, environment has changed. So maybe they've started getting reflux, maybe they're stressed or anxious and their muscles and their body starts working differently and putting that medial pressure on the vocal folds. 
I'm just pressing the pause button on the podcast for a very brief moment to invite you to book your free BAST call. If you've been thinking about joining the BAST community through one of our courses, but you just don't know which option is the best for you, then why not book your free Zoom chat with our very own Kimberly George, who has all the answers. Head over to basttraining.com forward slash book a call forward slash and click that big blue button. That's basttraining.com forward slash book a call forward slash. Now, where were we? We spoke with Dr. Ginevra Williams for episode 75 of this podcast on the topic of vocal rehabilitation for singers. And she shared her opinion that when a singer is experiencing vocal trouble and considering ENT intervention, they're better off seeing a singing teacher than nobody at all, because at least there's somebody looking out for the singer and checking in with them. In your opinion, as a voice specialising speech pathologist, how can singing teachers continue to work with a singer who maybe they think needs to see an ENT or is waiting for an appointment so that they can still have a support network, but working safely whilst we try to figure out what's going on? Mm. So I think the key element here is um, I, I do I do tend to agree that if some if a singer is has a singing teacher and they've realized, oh, there's something wrong with my voice, because you can't know if you have a, a nodule unless you've got a camera down your nose. And one of the things that I do hear from singers is that their singing teachers who have not put a scope down their nose will say, I think you have nodules, um, which is very wrong um, because that can cause panic and concern on the singer's part. They get worried that they have a voice injury and it's not even proven. They don't have, haven't had a camera down their nose and multiple times that has happened. They go to the ENT and their voice is fine. It's muscle tension dysphonia and it's got something to do with an environment. So what I'll say out to singing teachers out there is please do not diagnose your students. What you can say is I can hear this. I hear that your voice is doing this, or I've noticed that you can't sing as high as you used to, or you've said for me over the past couple of weeks, everything's feeling sore or it's starting to get tired. And you can use that as proof to say, I think it would be a great idea for you to get checked out by an ENT and a speech pathologist. But in the meantime, as the question you were asking about before, what are we supposed to do? So if your singing teacher has education on how to help rehabilitate a voice. Um, And there's lots of different interpretations um, of that. Um, It's very, very tricky as a speech pathologist to gauge who is an adequate person to send a singing student to, um, because not not all singing teachers are educated in how to help Keep a voice, uh, it's rather than keeping it rehabilitated, it's keeping it safe until they can be seen. I would say that. And I agree that they should still have people around them that um, are helping them check in, giving them options and ideas on what they can do if they come in with issues. Um, But until you know what the actual diagnosis is, you cannot safely and correctly create a rehabilitative voice program for an individual. It's just not ethical. We can't say, do these things and you will get better because we don't know that. It's just like if someone has, we think someone might have, you know, the big C cancer and we go, we don't actually know that yet, but we're just going to preemptively, we're going to put you on, you know, chemo, even though they don't know. And I know that that's an extreme example, but that's kind of it. So stay with your singing teacher if they have shown that they have professional development within that rehabilitative holding space to just monitor what's going on, but you're not seeing them necessarily to fix you in inverted commas because they don't know and you don't know what's actually wrong. It could be something completely, it could be a neuro, it could be like a, um, it could be something that's like neuro. So it could be, you know, neurodegenerative, like, Parkinson's or MND. Um, it could be things like um, papilloma in the vocal folds. It could be growths. It could be nothing. <laughs> um, so we don't want to necessarily start trying to treat singing students as singing teachers because we don't actually know what the issue is. 
I guess it's also hard to know where to work in terms of with a student who you think might have something going on because okay we could address this breath issue but that breath issue might have to be there because it's being maladaptive to another issue so I guess potentially it's slightly I don't want to say easier but I'm going to use that word because I can't think of another one <laughs> for the private <laughs> singing for the private singing teacher who can or does have the option to say you know what maybe you could be referred to here or let's get together once you've seen this person but for the teacher who is working in a peripatetic position in a school or in an institution where people have assessments that might not be so easy so how can we work safely with somebody who has performances graduation projects but also stay within our role as a singing teacher who might not have rehabilitative options. Yeah. So there it's about working with um, bringing in different, like the word you said before, options. So if you're working with someone within a school and you're a school teacher in that and there's a, uh, sorry, singing teacher in a school and they've got a performance or a play on or something like that and they're having to, they have to sing for certain reasons for assessments we go back to what I was talking about before which is what how can we get them to make sound that feels the safest to them and creates the most consistent sound and that's when you bring on board the music directors and you know school principals and things like that and say hi um so and so can't reach these high notes anymore um, I've talked to their parents about um, the issues that I'm hearing and they maybe the parents have said I don't want to look into that you've done your due diligence as a singing teacher if you've said look here are the problems I strongly recommend you go and see an ENT and a speech pathologist and this is if they refuse that and some people will as long as you write down in your notes that I spoke to the parents or I spoke to the students and they refused to go and you've talked to them a couple of times about it, then you kind of can wash your hands of it and go, okay, well, I'm just going to do my best to try and help you create a functional voice. So then you pull in the people from the school and say, can we change the key of this song? Can we can we bring it down? Or if they go, no, we can't because it's a musical, okay, can we change some of those higher pitched notes? Can we, ch can we make a, a melodic change and make it instead of an upwards rift, can we make it a downwards rift? So having those options in there, changing the key, changing the notes, people have to sing. Um, you can have someone, um, you can have two people on stage singing the same thing. And then some, and in the worst cases, what happens in, in, in musicals and stuff like that is that they'll have a, a track of someone playing and they will mime it. And there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> like people really poo-poo that. But if I'm keeping I'm keeping myself safe, this is about me and my instrument. I don't just use my voice to sing. I use it to go home and tell my family that I love them and read bedtime stories to my kids and to order food at the shops. Like it's not just about that performance. So viewing that person holistically. Um so, yeah, if you've tried as a singing teacher and you don't have that rehabilitative training, go with what the student is saying is safe. There's also some other things you can do. You can go and do some professional development. I know there are some lovely professional owners that that uh, rehabil singing voice course, at the rehabilitation course at Voice Care Centre, Stephen King, Stephen's yeah, one. the vocal health um, Education. Health, edu that one. They've got some beautiful programs that run through there. Um, there's other things like I once a month I run something called a singing teacher support session. And it's 30 Australian dollars, which is like, I don't know, 12 pounds or 15 pounds. Um, and anyone from all over the world can join and you can bring your student case studies. And you say, hey, Ellie, these are the things I've tried. This is what's going on with my student. We don't, it's de-identified, we don't use names. And what, what can I try? And then I can, you, you have access to a voice specializing speech language pathologist, and I can give you options on things that you can, you can try out 
further education that you can go and do. So that's my way of trying to bridge this gap of, okay, well, if I can't necessarily, maybe I maybe I can't afford professional development, or maybe I can't get my student in to see a speech pathologist as quickly as I'd like to, this is an accessible way that I have come up with for people to um, access um, someone who, who has that education background in voice rehabilitation, singing and speaking. Great. So in your opinion, then, what is within the role of the singing teacher to be able to do and what starts to creep into speech pathologist land that perhaps we shouldn't enter? Mm. It's really hard because they are so intertwined. I think if we did one of those you know, those bubble charts where you had all the lines intercrossing, there'd be lots of things that, in, that, that intercede. Um, but when we know that someone has a voice disorder, um, and like I said, the majority of times I see people with voice disorders, it derives from a speaking voice. Um, that's when it should be speech pathologist, but they can still have their singing lessons if it, if the speech pathologist and the ENT agree that it's safe, as long as they agree that it's safe, um, they can still have their singing lessons alongside. It is then just the singing teacher and the speech pathologist's responsibility to communicate well with each other. So usually what will happen is if I have a singing student who I know is actively working with a singing teacher, I'll do their initial assessment and then maybe a couple of, ex um, couple of weeks of sessions and then I'll write to the singing teacher and say, hi, um, I understand you're seeing blah, blah, blah. This is my assessment. These is, this is what we've done that have been the most successful. And these are the things I recommend that you don't do with them whilst we're, whilst we're in rehabilitation. Because it's also important to understand we don't, I don't see patients for much longer than maybe three months three to four months maximum, unless it's a very complex issue. I'm seeing people for, you know, six to 12 sessions over two to three months, and then that's it, which is a very, very different protocol to singing lessons, which people think that they need to have them every single week or every fortnight for years and years and years, um, which in my opinion is not necessarily true. I think we've got to maybe have a look at how we work singing lessons um, because if I can get someone from a dysfunctional, atypical voice having nodules to completely retraining them within 12 weeks, what are singing teachers doing with their students for two years that they can't get them to maybe belt for two years or something like that? So, and the difference between that is I have very intensive anatomy driven and focused training that I have to do. Um, I have to do um professional development. I have to do CPD. I have to have those points. I have to have a piece of paper signed saying I'm a part of the speech pathology association. There's a certain amount of pressure that you just don't have as a singing teacher. And what I want to ask is why would you want that? <laughs> why would you want to have that kind of over your shoulder? These are the things that you must do. So what I would say is, um, if you, you get to work with typically well students' voices, some rehabilitating voices, um, but apart from that, if you can handball that student off to someone who has the health, who has the insurance for if something goes wrong, they get sued. And there, I've had several instances of patients that I know who have sued their singing teachers because they've tried to rehabilitate their voice without referring them on. That's the other big side of this. It's not saying that you can't do this. I'm sure that a good majority of singing teachers could help their students get to a point where they don't have to see a medical professional. But why would you want to risk that when you when someone's literally trained to do that? Mm. Um, so there's those other things to consider. It's more than just ego and I can do this. It's there's, there's a legal side to this. There's an ethical side to this. Um, so, yeah, that's 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 yeah. my very convoluted answer. <laughs> it, it fills me with fear, to be honest, when, when I think about, you know, there's a particular student in front of me and I think, yeah, I, I couldn't personally go there because I'm, I'm, 
I even to the tax person I'm like sorry I think there's just two p you've missed off here yeah <laughs> whereas I'm anyone sorry. else would be fine send me to jail <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm really interested now because you said about the six to 12 sessions um, and, you know, yeah, thinking about how we work as teachers and our progress over a certain amount of time. What actually is the typical process in rehabilitation from, say, ENT diagnosis through to your final session? I know everyone's going to be a bit different, but what does mm. that typically look like? Look, if a person gets in to see an ENT first before a speech pathologist, um, there's, yeah, there's usually two pathways. They realise there's something wrong with their voice, and this isn't necessarily just singers. This is, let's say, just a, a I don't know, a school teacher maybe. Mm -hmm. They realise there's something wrong with their voice. They go to their GP. They get a referral to see an ENT. They go on a wait list to see that ENT. <laughs> maybe they see them in two months' time, and the ENT says yes, I can see you have muscle tension dysphonia and they refer them to say me. And so then they book in to see me for an initial appointment, which goes for an hour. And I do an acoustic assessment on them, take their full case history, real, work out whether there's any reflux things. I do something called an oromotor assessment on people to check their cranial nerves, things like that, just ruling out. Oh, and I check in, the, in on their swallowing, ruling out if there's anything else that this could be apart from just a voice issue, um, inclusive of things like anxiety, mental health and stuff like that. It's a very big puzzle piece, puzzle that we put together. After that, usually we'll have, I book people in for four weeks in a row of very intense vocal training. And so I'll see them four weeks in a row, usually for 45 minutes, maybe an hour session. Um, and we just work on their whatever vocal exercises I'm giving them to target. So if it's muscles, tension, dysphonia, I will be doing some of that SOVT work. I will probably be, be, be targeting um, things like SOB, which is where we're making the pharynx wider, the uh, dropping the larynx a little bit, um, trying to get the vocal folds to come together very gently. And then after about I'd say probably on the third week, that's when I start to really amp it up and go, okay, we're going to start trying to implement these brand new muscular skills that I've taught you and that you've been working on. We're going to try and implement them into your day-to-day -day life. So then we come up with ways to, okay, because it's sometimes hard because you're like, well, this is a completely new way of speaking to me. And so then they go, I go, okay, every time you go into your kitchen at home, because that's usually the place where people talk the most, um, when you go into your kitchen, that's going to be your reminder that you're going to be speaking with your, you know, your sob voice or your humming voice or whatever we've ended up calling it. And then they gradually start to generalize these exercises across. And it really depends on how fast this progresses. It really depends on how frequently you do your exercises um, and how willing you are to, to generalize that across into your everyday and that can be really tricky for some people because let's say I'm working with someone who's maybe 65 and lives alone and they don't have anyone that they're talking to. We then have to come up with things like, okay, you're going to read out loud from a book once every two hours with practicing your exercises, or you're going to talk to your cat or your dog or your bird. Um, and so then working on how to actually put this into, into their lives. So um all in all, from GP referral to the end, you're maybe looking at something like five or six months, but the window in which you have intensive voice therapy and we start to generalise you out is about that 12-week mark. Yeah. Because you've got both, you're a singing teacher and you're a speech pathologist, do you integrate these things together? So if you're noticing some speaking voice inefficiencies, would you do a couple of minutes on that in the lesson and then go into singing? How, how do you integrate them? Yeah, so I am very clear on my boundaries with this. So if someone comes to see me as a singing student, I can work on their singing stuff with them. I might work on some singing voice rehabilitation stuff. Um, but if they ask about speaking voice stuff and I notice speaking things, I will get them to book in with me at the clinic and at the voice clinic. So I will see them as a as for speaking voice therapy and then I'll see them privately as a singing teacher at the same time um, because there's just too much to cover 
in across those two things. Yes, it's the same mechanism and things like that, but as singers usually find, they'll be like, but my singing voice is great. Why is my speaking voice, you know, not? I've practiced singing technique my whole life. It's very different. We're taught all about breathing for singing like our whole lives if we're singers. But never once are we talked to about our breathing for speaking, which is really important. Um, for some people and others, they don't have a problem with it at all. So um, I keep them very separate because they are very separate exercises, techniques, um, and they require, um, you know, a different different outlook because singing is very, can be very emotive. Speaking also can be, um, but in a different way because you realised you realize I can't talk on the phone to my family for an hour. You get upset from that over, I can't sing that high note, very kind of different worlds and different impacts in different parts of our lives. So if you had to say the main differences between working on speaking voice and working on the singing voice, what would they be, do you think? If I'm working with a singer on their speaking voice in clinic, the biggest thing, the biggest hurdle there is teaching them to unlearn what they've learned about <laughs> singing <laughs> and um, and not try and apply it and analyse it when we're talking about speaking. If, yeah, if I'm working with singers on speaking, that's kind of the biggest barrier for me is um, working with them is going, don't think of this like singing. It's a kind of a very different mechanism, even though it's the same thing. It really depends on who the patient is and who the person is, whether they are a singer or not. Speaking voice, I would say, is very a lot more regimented than working on someone as a singing teacher, like um, because you can be a lot more kind of fluid in in singing teaching. Um, again, there is the emotional side of singing te- singing, which uh, I find people are far more impacted working on singing voice rehabilitation than speaking voice rehabilitation because people take such joy from singing. Um, so you're navigating that emotional response, which will often, you know, manifest in a lot of singers in their throat. Um, so I work a lot more on release. Um, so like manual release, I do, I do, I'm a vocal, I'm a speech pathologist and we do vocal massage therapy, but I'm trained in vocal massage therapy as well. So I do I'll get them to do a lot more release work, a lot more work on their tongue as singers, um, especially people who, you know, have, have tried to darken their sound. Maybe they've sounded quite bright. They try to darken their sound. They pull their tongue back and down to kind of get that more um, bit muffled, darker tone to make what they think makes their set voice sound more interesting, but it's actually creating some dysfunction in their voice. Um, Whereas speaking, I get a lot of, and I find singers are really, when we're doing singing voice rehabilitation, are really eager to get the techniques and they want to get it done fast. Whereas speaking, um, speaking therapy, sometimes people are a bit resistant to it because they're like, I've been talking my whole life. Like, I know how to talk. What do you mean I have to do this weird little humming thing and it's going to fix my life? (laughs) Um, So they're a bit more resistant to it. Um, But all they need is that, all they need is some, um, you know, education around why we're doing what we're doing. And if you can, if you're a good listener with your patients and you can kind of mimic back to them what they've said, I've heard you, you're experiencing this, this, and this, these are the exercises that can target this, this, and this, and it takes this long. Um, That can be really helpful. So, yeah. Voice is so inextricably linked to our identity. I wonder how you help people to maintain a healthy voice but also in a way that speaks to how they identify in the world. So you do quite a bit of work with transgender voice. So yeah. I'm interested in how you help in that scenario. Yeah. Um, most um, trans people or people seeking gender affirming voice therapy or training, they have an idea of what they want to sound like and, um, and a lot of them will identify it as they want their pitch to be higher. And I will say this just straight from the get-go. I typically work most with um, trans women um, because when you t- start taking estrogen, so your HRT, 
um, you don't get any physical changes to the size of your larynx or the size of your vocal folds. Whereas if you're a trans man taking HRT, so taking testosterone, the larynx cartilage starts to grow, the thyroid cartilage starts to grow and the vocal folds start to grow and that changes the pitch of their voice. So typically for trans men, I don't see a humongous amount of them in clinic because they just over time their voice um, transitions across to what they are looking for. So I mostly work with trans women um, and it can be really tricky for both the patient and the um clinician because you know we know okay we want to we want to increase pitch but then there's other things it's not just about pitch so it's this pitch um there's articulation there's um weight of the voice there's resonance factors there's how quick you talk um and all of those factors depending on where they are can be perceived as more of a masculine voice and more of a feminine voice so um it's a, it's a very much a spectrum some people will come in and they'll go I want to be I want to sound hyper feminine I want to sound super feminine and some people go I want to sound androgynous so you're very very much working as a team with your client to find a balance of what makes them feel the most authentic to themselves but another one is what actually makes them feel the safest because safety is a huge thing in the trans community. And if they feel like, and this is a word in trans, um, the trans community is passing. If they feel like they're not passing as their affirmed gender, they there can be safety concerns. Because if, if they um, don't match with what other people think their voice should sound like or what they should look like, um, unfortunately, some people are very violent um, towards individuals who are just literally living their lives, um, which I'm very angry about, um, but another time. So, yeah, it's a matter of does it match their affirmed um, gender and is it safe for them to use their voice? Um, so it's, this, it's a very different scope to just voice therapy for a voice because it's not a voice disorder. They don't have a disordered voice. They have a voice that we need to train to match their gender identity. And if we can't achieve that in um, gender affirming voice training, and I will say there's several studies out there that talk about how, because um, there's a couple of options, there's voice training and then there's um, a Wendler's glottoplasty. What it's called, yeah, Wendler's glottoplasty, which is a surgical procedure you can get done if your vocal folds look like a V, um, they essentially just stitch together the bottom part of the V to make the vocal folds shorter. The shorter the vocal folds are, the higher the pitch. And so they get it stitched together and then naturally their voice will sound higher. Um, but the studies that have been done on people who've had just voice training versus whether they've had Wendler's glottoplasty have shown very similar results in terms of the pitch, in, in terms of what other people perceive their voice to sound like. However, from their own perspective, the people who have had the Wendler's glottoplasty will say they noticed more of a like difference with their voice um, than if they just had voice training. So it's it's a very different self-perception versus public perception of the voice and then um, measured acoustical outcomes. So um, some people, even though they get great results in voice training, will go, no, I still want to have the surgery. Um, but they both have very, very similar, if not almost identical, acoustic outcomes. And can you point us in the direction of any of those people or studies that have come out about that so we can look it up? Yeah, so um, a friend of mine from the US, her name's Sarah Brown, um, she did a study on the, the exact thing, comparing um, uh, Wendell's glottoplasty with voice training for trans women. Um, so you can look up, yeah, Sarah Brown, um, she did it through Mount Sinai. I can't remember the exact name of the study, but you can look her up. Sarah Brown on, on Instagram. She is Vocal Health SKB and she's a wonderful resource. As She's also a voice specialising speech pathologist and a singing teacher as well. Great. Thank you. As you continue your work as a speech pathologist and singing teacher, what are you noticing are the patterns in injury itself and also the attitude to injury in the industry? Um, I think I've been trying to 
uh, champion this and talk about this for a long time now um, because I know that oftentimes when singers get vocal injuries, um, they are perceived by their cast members and by the community as you have bad vocal technique, in inverted commas, um, and they'll often attribute that to their singing technique. But as I just spoke about before with my patients, about 95% of them, it's the speaking. So it's not the being on stage for 90 minutes or, you know, if, if you're doing a 90-minute show, you might only be singing for 20 minutes. It's not the 20 minutes of singing that's the issue. It's the the environment and the lifestyle that they're living after the show and before the show that's contributing to the vocal injury. Um, and so unfortunately when you choose to be a performer, whether it's an actor or a singer, you are choosing to have a lifestyle of you wake up in the morning, you steam, you know, you eat well so you don't get reflux, you go for a walk, you move your body, you go to the show, you warm up, you do the show, you go home, you don't go out and you, par- you don't party. Um, and it, it's so, it, it is, it's the fun police. And if you want to go out, if you need to go to, I don't know, an after party or something like that, premiere party, you have to really choose how you're going to work with your day before that happens. And then, you know, you're going to nick off to the bathrooms halfway through and do some SOVT into your straw to help revitalize your voice before you go out and have to talk in that very loud environment with lots of music. So, um, and we know this, we know, and performers know that that is the toll on the voice, yet we still decide to, um, you know, shame and ostracize people who do get vocal injuries. My opinion that I will very happily shout from rooftops is that singers with vocal injuries or who have who have rehabilitated from vocal injuries are the people we should be seeking out the most for information on the voice in the community because they've had to deal with the emotional load of having to deal with I've got a vocal injury oh my gosh how do I make money because money my voice is how I make money how long do I have to rehabilitate with this? They go through and they find the best specialists that they can. They speak to all the people. They read all the articles. They read all the books. They know so much about this thing. Um, so they, I think they really should be rehabilitated voices. People who have rehabilitated their own voice should be quite revered and, and looked, up, looked up to in our community for um, advice on, on, on vocal issues because they know what it's like to have had a voice and to have lost it gone through that journey and then come out the other end. So um, it, it, just look at it like this. If you were a football player, whether you're thinking that as Australian rules football or soccer in the, in the UK, uh, football, if you, you know, do your ACL on the field, no one goes, oh, you have horrendous football playing technique. <laughs> they just go, oh, no, you were doing your job and you got hurt. And now we rehabilitate. And then when they get back on the field, they're celebrated. Whereas when singers oftentimes get back on the stage, people are looking to be like, um, are they going to do it again? Like, is their voice going to get tired again? They shouldn't be doing that. Like, it's just a very different world. And I think it very much lends to the culture around uh, the entertainment industry versus, say, the sporting industry where they kind of lift each other a bit more. Um and there isn't as like there's still rivalry, but it's in a bit of a different bit of a different context. Can you tell us about Vocal Lab Australia and congratulations because you've recently won an award, haven't you? Yeah, I did. Um, I won um, something called the Brain Award um, with a, a an Australian organisation called the Seven Effects, which um, celebrates women in business and in life. So I was very surprised and um, happy to receive that. So yeah, Vocalab is a voice service. We are based in Australia. Um, The clinic is in Australia, but we do in South Australia, but we do telehealth. So we, I actually see patients from all over the world. I've got a few UK patients, US, uh, Singapore, everywhere. So that's in the clinic for vocal rehabilitation. So sometimes I'll find people go, there's a huge wait list where I live. Can I book in with you? And um, you just got to call up or email and our receptionist will get through to you. Oftentimes um, as well, 
it's more expensive in other countries, but the Australian dollar and the exchange rate, it's a little, it might be cheaper. So especially for someone in the UK, I know there's a lot of, you've got the wonderful NHS and you can access things for free all the time, but if you have to go private, hi. Um, so we've got the clinic side, Vocal Lab Voice Clinic with myself and um, my other colleague, Sonia Mohanaraj, who's our other voice specialising speech pathologist. Um, and then I have singing teachers who are trained by me and they have their own specialist areas based in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and Adelaide. And we also just have um, brought on board a performance anxiety coach. Her name is Andrea Fleming and she's based out of New York. Um, so we're kind of all over the place for in person and online. Um, but I would say by far my, my favorite thing about Vocalab and it was how I started it was I wrote a course called the Vocal Educator Toolkit, um, when I was in my final year of speech pathology and I realized that there was this huge gap between singing teachers and speech pathologists. And I thought I'm going to write a course that, combine singing teaching with speech pathology um, practices and evidence-based practice. Um, and it has been, it's a hundreds and hundreds of educators across the globe have taken it. And it's been by far my favorite thing because people leave feeling very knowledgeable about the voice, very empowered and very confident. And they just, you know, know what to do um, now. There's no questions. And they also then get to join the Vocal Lab online community, and I regularly post free resources on lots of very typical questions people ask about the voice and, and non-typical questions they ask about the voice. So it's very much an all-in-one um, voice service. Um, yeah, and it's global, which is awesome. So where can our listeners find out about it and maybe get involved? Yeah, um, so our website, vocalab.com.au, um, that's V O C A L, so like vocal, and then A B, not two, not two L's. dot com today. Everything is on there. Um, but then on uh, Instagram, you can find us at Vocalab A U. Um, and yeah, you can sign up for our programs. You can talk, go on to that singing teacher support session that I was talking about. That very accessible way to you know get in contact with with me and other specialists. Um, or, you know, join one of our live in-person courses. We have, um, we're doing an Australian tour of our advanced vocal technique workshop this year. Um, and I was just in New York running one of those workshops in December. So if you want me to come to uh, the UK, just let me know and uh, yeah. I'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, Ellie Holiday, it's been so awesome to be with you today. Thank you so much for giving me your time. Oh, thank you for your wonderful questions. This has been a delight. Do, do, do.